There has to be some common sense. Yes, sir, they have the car stopped at 10th and Grant, Michael Biden. We still don't know who pulled the trigger. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Police Off the Cuff, Real Crime Stories. I'm your host, retired NYPD Sergeant Bill Cannon, a 27-year veteran at a Manhattan North Homicide Squad. And with me today is retired NYPD detective and straight out of Brooklyn, Phil Grimaldi. How are you doing today, Phil? I'm doing pretty good, Billy. How about you? You know, that there's so many things going on right now. I mean, the news cycle, especially local news you and I spoke a little bit about uh, local news, and the, the big story was that transit uh, cop, two cops that took on two turnstile jumpers uh, up, I think it was at East Harlem, and they wound up taking a beating by these two perps, and it was, it was just it was hard to watch. And there were really so was. many things wrong with it. Uh, and one of the big things wrong with it, of course, is that cops are afraid to put their hands on people. But, you know, I'm speaking right to this cop, and I don't know your name, and I, I, I'm glad you survived that ordeal. Once someone punches you in the face, oh, all deals are off. All bets are off. I don't care what the city council says. I don't care what Governor Hochul says. I don't care what Eric Adams says. You beat the shit out of that guy, you know? And even if you lose your job, you go home. That was pathetic to watch. And the female officer, you need to go back for retraining. You have no clue how to fight. I mean, it was really tough to watch, Phil. You know what, Billy? I uh, understand that there was a like three minute tirade by these two individuals, not only the male perpetrator, but the female as well. So they engaged in conversation. And my rule of thumb was when I give an order and you start to push back on me, we're going to the next level. They didn't go to the next level, which the next level is handcuffs and you're under arrest and the whole bit. It seemed like they went back and forth with them trying it to eject them from the system. Now, either you're going to do zero, uh, you know, uh, a zero tolerance enforcement policy where somebody beats the turnstile, they jump over the turnstile, they beat the fair. You're going to either make an arrest or give a summons or whatever it is. They're subjected from the system. That's what caused them to become irate that they wanted to go wherever it was they were going. When the officers saw that this thing, and it's easy for me to say this at this point, but we're going by what we know and, and experience. I was a transit cop for a year in 1982 to 1983, so I do have a little bit of experience with it. But once the, you get to that level where you're in, an, uh, uh, you know, they're going to resist, a conversation ensues, they're going to push back. No, it's time for the handcuffs. And like you said, Bill, tactics weren't that great. Uh, the officer, you know, you, both officers are carrying firearms, tasers, and mace. Now, those are, uh, one is uh, a lethal. The firearm is obviously lethal. The taser and the mace are non-lethal. But if uh, the perpetrator gets a hold of these, can hurt the, the officer can hurt innocent civilians. So, again, uh, there really is uh, a reluctance for officers to Unfortunately, like you said, once you get cracked in the face, all bets are off. You know, Phil, the thing is, when you're wearing that uniform, you represent that uniform. You represent the city of New York, you know. Great point. But more more importantly, that thing over here above my show that says Cannon, I represent the Cannon family. And I ain't getting my ass kicked. Someone hits me in the face. They got a problem. And, you know, I said to you earlier, I would have grabbed that guy by his hair and I would have ripped him. I would have spun him around like a rag doll. You know, and I mean, are you kidding me, dude? Both of them, if you're listening, Eric Adams, they need to go back to training. Both of them. It just it was pathetic to watch. Extremely pathetic. Uh, their supervisors send them to training forthwith. And the people in the stuff, maybe you guys need to be retrained, too. It's disgusting to watch. Disgusting. I watched a uh, news uh, program last night and there was a civil rights attorney by the name of Leo Terrell, who is African-American. And he said, where is Black Lives Matter? Is this? He was outraged. He said, this is a black perpetrator assaulting a black police officer. Where's Al Sharpton? Where's Black Lives Matter? And he makes a point. There should be outrage about this. A police officer should not be assaulted like that. There's no more 
uh, fear of the police. There's no more, you know, respect for the police. And this is a perpetrator that was out on uh, an open robbery case and arrested for gun possession not long ago with a loaded firearm. And perhaps he had the idea in his head that he wanted to take the officer's gun. We don't know what was going through his mind, but he was fighting like a real animal. And uh, I think there needs to be a little bit more of pushback from the mayor. There needs to be more pushback from the police commissioner. There needs to be more counsel on these type of things and we need the support the officers can't do the job if they're worried about every little thing that they do that they're going to be held accountable and they're going to be put under a microscope so again it's going to lead to officer assaults increasing uh injuries to members of the service and the public at large is going to pay the price let me tell you something eric adams should go right to the city council forthwith and show them that video and say you know what caused this the diaphragm law, the law that you passed, that's what's causing this. Next time we're going to have a dead cop because of you, that's what caused this, the diaphragm law. Then go to Hochul, another I was just going to say that. gem. Bail reform must go. And then, you know, I'm going on a rant. This guy Bragg, he's got to go. Get rid of that guy. He does not be long being a DA. He doesn't prosecute. This moron was out in a day. He was released after he punched the cop in the face. He he was out within hours of that, Billy, and hours of a, a vicious assault on a uniformed police officer. So if he's willing to attack a uniformed police officer, where the civilian stands in this, they're, they're just at risk 100%. And this animal is riding the subways, placing people, the, the, the riding public in unsafe situations. And again, I'm so glad you brought up Hochul and Bragg because this scumbag was out without any bail on a robbery charge. Like I said, he was also out on a loaded firearm charge that needs to be brought to the governor and say, it's about time that you get on the state and we have bail reform. It has to be completely reversed. We need bail. Judges don't have any discretion to hold people that are a threat to the, uh, to the community at large uh, on bail. And it's just a ridiculous policy. It's not working. It's placing everyone, including police officers at risk of violent attack. Hochul, you know something, pay attention. All right. You may get defeated in November because also the Republican candidate for governor, someone tried to assault him with a razor until four guys jumped the guy. He was also released. He was also released on bail. Are you kidding me? You need, you know, Believe me, Hochul, you may get defeated. You can start with getting rid of Bragg. You have the power to do that. Get rid of that guy. He's a disaster. And anyone that this guy Soros, that billionaire leftist, anyone that he paid a million dollars to get them elected, get rid of that guy too if they're in New York State because it is pathetic. It's disgraceful. And Hochul, you may get defeated. So don't get so cocky because you're a Democrat that you're going to walk through the door. Lee Zeldin said minute one, if he's elected minute one, the minute he swore in the first thing he's going to do is relieve Bragg of being the district attorney in New York County minute one. That's one of the first things one of his policies that he talks about. First thing he's going to do is relieve him. And I think that that right there alone, especially after he was attacked by that guy wielding it, it was some kind of a, a almost like a brass knuckle with spikes on it going for his throat. Thank God he's an ex-military guy. He grabbed the guy's wrist. Other people interjected and they got wrestled the guy to the ground. And within three or four hours, the guy was back out on the street. Now, I think there is a federal charge that they're coming up with, but that guy should not have been released. Governor Hochul, I just hope and pray that you are defeated. And minute one, Bragg will be out the door and then we can get some uh, some change in New York State. The New York City and New York State needed change, well-needed change. It's despicable. And Eric Adams, if you're listening, I invite you on the show. I'd like to hear your explanation for this stuff. Love to have and I'd like to hear, I would like to hear, what are you doing about it? Did you go to the city council and show them that video? Are you considering putting transit anti-crime back? Because then you need that. You need this little mope and his girlfriend to fear, to fear anti-crime. They don't fear anybody because they're getting away with this shit. And you're, you know, you're there giving chanting speeches with your John Gotti suits. You know, it's like ridiculous. I, you know, and we've had it. You know, cops that have retired, when we watch this shit, we would get sick to our stomach. We really do. And it's, it's just, it's pathetic. And when you stand there with your, and give these stupid speeches, it means nothing because you're not doing anything about it. 
The chairman in the, of the MTA said that fair evasion has tripled in the last year and a half, I guess at the start of the pandemic till now, it's tripled. Now, it was always a problem. Now it's triple as bad. That's lost revenue. Well, all it's going to do, it's going to raise the price of the fare. And who's it going to affect? It's going to affect the people at the bottom of the, of the totem pole that really can't afford it. Like, you said, you know, let's get some anti-crime with at least six members in the detail that they can stop two or three people jumping the fare and they're not going to be overpowered. And you can have people that'll keep the crowd back because if you look at that incident, there were seven or eight people standing around videotaping this nonsense instead of calling for 911 or trying to help these officers that with this raving lunatic that was foaming from the mouth just about. And he didn't have any bail. Ah, it's just making me sick, Billy. This guy, Jano Lieber, who you just alluded to, who's the head of the MTA, he's a clown too. So I don't oh, want to yeah, hear his, absolutely. you know, he, he suggested a year or two ago that the train, that the trains be free. Yeah, let's put more on the taxpayer, Jano Lieber, to pay your $450,000 a year salary. No, that's not the answer. The answer is to police it correctly and to have the cameras that work. Like it didn't work that time the guy shot up the train. And that's your fault, Jano Lieber. So I don't want to hear about these clowns these executive clowns. Let's do something before a cop gets killed. It's disgusting. Absolutely, Billy. Yeah, he, he's a clown show. I agree with you 100%. I was just, uh, you know, noting the statistic that it's tripled. And, you know, there, there used to be a time when I was a transit cop in 1982 and we would go out and we would do, you know, fair beats and we would issue a summons if they had identification. And if they didn't, they would go through the system for theft of service and you would bring down the amount of people not paying the fare. I mean, you know, th there's millions and millions of dollars being lost here on a monthly basis just in fare evasion. And again, who is the people that are beating the fare? Generally, it's people that are going to go on to the subway to commit crime. Nobody that's going on to the subway to commit a robbery is going to pay the fare. And, and, right Phil, and the Phil, do you know why? Do you know why they put up with it? Do you know why? Because... In the rearview mirror is congestion pricing where people, taxpayers from the suburbs, are going to drive their evil carbon burning car into the city and they're going to, the city's going to annihilate them with a 15 or $20 easy pass hit if they go past a certain street. That's who's going to pay for the fare jumpers. Another thing is they also now have speed cameras also going after the evil carbon burning car owners from the suburbs we're going to hit them for a fifty hundred dollar summons if they go over 35 miles an hour all why all while the savages are jumping the turnstiles and we're doing absolutely nothing about it i just got one of those bill i was going down a street in brooklyn there's no school on the block now this is supposedly speed cameras are pr to protect children around schools there's no school on the block the speed limit is 25 i was going 36 and without real, realizing it on a Sunday afternoon where the, the cameras weren't enforced until after te, uh, at 10 o'clock at night, they would go off. And on the weekends, they'd be off. Well, they changed that law. It was a Sunday afternoon. I'm going 36 miles an hour and I got a $50 gift in the mail. Now, listen, I'm not saying that I wasn't wrong. I was going over the speed limit. But I mean, let's get real. It's supposed to be around schools, school safety. I get that. Okay. There's no problem with having very low speed limits in and around schools, but there was no school on this block. And again, they're throwing it out there Monday to fr uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It used to be Monday to Friday up until I think from 7 a.m. or 8 a.m. in the morning till about 10 o'clock at night. And then we were off on weekends. But again, like you said, let's just go after people that are you know, uh, just th they have the uh, availability to own a car. Well, now you're going to get a little extra tax. Yeah, let's let's kill them. You know, folks, this this actually wasn't we went on the, a rant. Here. This know. wasn't the topic of today's show. The topic of today's show, and I'm glad we covered it because it's infuriating. This is a police show, right? And we're former police officers, sergeants, detectives. So we have to voice our concerns, and I and I know that our audience. And many people out there that are listening, they were infuriated by that video also. And I don't want to see a cop killed because they're afraid to use gotcha. force. And the, and the executives of the NYPD and the politicians refuse to step up. Step up now before a cop gets killed because that's what's going to happen. Um, agree with you more, Bill. There was an article in today's New York Times 
smuggling migrants at the border, now a billion dollar business. Now, I don't know how this all of a sudden became, oh, we realized it's a billion dollar business that this just occurred to them. Uh, and a lot of this is in Texas. From the street, the little brown house was unremarkable yet pleasant. A bright yellow toy school bus and a red truck hung on the hog wire fence. And the home's facade featured a large Texas Lone Star. But in the backyard was a gutted mobile home that a prosecutor later described as a house of horrors. It was discovered one day in 2014 when a man called from Maryland to report that his stepfather, Moises Ferrara, a migrant from Honduras, was being held there and tortured by the smugglers who had brought him into the United States. His captors wanted more money, the stepson said, and were pounding Mr. Ferrara's hands repeatedly with a hammer vowing to continue until his family sent it. When federal agents and sheriff's deputies descended on the house, they discovered that Mr. Farrar was not the sole victim. Smugglers had held hundreds of migrants for ransom there, their investigation found. They had mutilated limbs and raped women. What transpired there is the subject of science fiction, of a horror movie, and something we simply don't see in the United States the prosecutor, Matthew Waters, told the jury when the accused smugglers went on trial. Organized crime cartels, he said, had brought this terror across the border. But if it was one of the first such cases, it was not the last. Migrant smuggling on the U.S. southern border has evolved over the last 10 years from a scattered network of freelance coyotes into a multi-billion dollar international business controlled by organized crime, including some of Mexico's most violent drug cartels. The deaths of 53 migrants in San Antonio last month who were packed in the back of a suffocating tractor trailer without air conditioning, the deadliest smuggling incident in the country to date, came as tightened U.S. border restrictions exacerbated by a pandemic-related public health rule have encouraged more migrants to turn to smugglers. While migrants have long faced kidnappings and extortion in Mexican border cities, such incidents have been on the rise on the U.S. side, according to federal authorities. More than 5,046 people were arrested and charged with human smuggling last year, up from 2762 in 2014. Over the past year, federal agents have raided stash houses, holding dozens of migrants on nearly a daily basis. So all of a sudden... We're realizing this is going on. It's been going on for 10 years. And one of the big reasons I believe that we're, we're finding out about it is that many of these migrants are winding up in cities where we live. For example, New York, uh, other big cities. Uh, Mayor Adams just complained that they cannot uh, pay for all these migrants. They don't have the money. They need federal funds. But at the same time, I'd like to rem remind everyone who's listening that New York City is a sanctuary city. So yeah, aren't they asking that. for it? Aren't they asking for it? Your thoughts, Phil? Oh, my God. Yes. Uh, he was complaining that uh, they were being bussed into New York City from the Texas border, I believe. And like you said, Billy, this is a sanctuary state where if there is some type of immigration enforcement going to be put on you if you're an illegal alien you come to new york and they put a stop to it so again it's like asking for illegal immigrants to come to our state so i think that uh him you know complaining about it is just very ironic it's hypocritical um you know the whole democratic party uh is really really uh, they're living a lie the secretary of homeland security Mayorkas over the weekend was on the Sunday morning shows and he had the goal and the balls to say, and I say the balls for a reason that the border is secure completely and totally delusional. He's delusional. If he believes that to make that statement, how the reporter didn't call him an outright liar. When we know it's happening, thousands and thousands every single day are coming over the border and he has the gall and the nerve to say, that the border is secure? Well, then why would the mayor of Chicago be complaining? Why would the mayor of New York be complaining that people are being sent to their town if the border is secure? It's an outright lie. It's a joke. However, we knew this when Joe Biden was uh, elected. Uh, you know, love him, hate him. Donald Trump 
said all of the things that are occurring right now, that we would have high gas prices, that we would have inflation, that we would have thousands of people coming over the border. You know, his policies, he, he came off as, you know, a little wild at times, but his policies were doing very well for the United States. I mean, gas was about $2 a gallon. It's over five at times in certain areas. It's a little under five, but, and then the border was basically, Almost secure. I won't say 100% because the walls hadn't been finished, but it was very close to secure. And the general, you know, the, the economy in the United States was doing very well. We're a capitalist country and we had capitalism working very well. But again, uh, we're dealing with Biden now. We're dealing with the open border policies. And uh, there's about, uh, they, they think at the end of his uh, presidency, we're going to have about 20 million extra people based on the fact that we, we're up to about almost 10 million now that are unaccounted for came over the border and are allowed to stay. It's unbelievable. Uh, law enforcement agents have engaged in so many high speed chases of smugglers lately in Yavalde, Texas. Do you recognize the name Yavalde? That's where the Rob school happened, where they had the active shooter where 19 students and two teachers were murdered by the active shooter. Um, there were nearly 50 such bailouts in the town between February and May that some school employees said they failed to take a lockdown order seriously during a mass shooting in May because so many previous lockdowns have been ordered when smugglers race through the streets. So again, that's sort of like the boy who cried wolf. Teofilo Valencia, whose 17 and 19 year old sons perished in the San Antonio tragedy, said he had taken out a loan against the family home to pay the smugglers 10,000 for each son's transport. Fees typically range from 4000 for migrants coming from Latin America to 20000 if they must be moved from Africa, Eastern Europe, or Asia, according to Guadalupe Ferreira Cabrera, an expert on smuggling at George Mason University. For years, independent coyotes paid cartels a tax to move migrants through territory they controlled along the border, and the criminal syndicate stuck to their traditional line of business, drug smuggling, which was far more profitable. Uh, I mean, it, it's very difficult to understand. Why is this being allowed to go on? Why is this being allowed? What What is the end game to this? You know, I know that, you know, people will deny this, and I know Mallorca's even denied it. A plane flew into Westchester Airport on, after midnight, filled with migrants, and they were dumping them in Westchester. What What, what, what free country does that? And what are you hiding? Why are you hiding that? If if you're bringing migrants in, illegal aliens into a a, a county or a city, why are you doing it in the uh, in the dead of night? Why aren't you doing it in the daytime? Billy, I want to expand a little bit on that uh, statistic you brought up about Uvalde. Now, between February and May of 2022, there were 50 bailouts. What a bailout is is when people are coming over the border, they're smuggling humans whether they be in the trunk of the car or the back of a truck, whatever it is. And then when the border patrol or law enforcement tries to engage them, they run. Now, most of the people that are coming over the border, they will turn themselves in because they want to have sanctuary in the United States and they want to have a case where they could say that they're fleeing oppression or whatever it is. But the ones that do the runs, the bailouts, those are the ones that either have tried to come over before, have criminal records, or they're smuggling narcotics. Now, because there were 50 of those incidents between fit February and May that they can account in Uvalde, some of the people, like you said, within that school didn't take the lockdown seriously. So what is it? We're getting a side effect. We're getting collateral damage from the problem at the border. And some of the blood of those children is on the hands of the government of United States because they're not enforcing the border. I'm sorry. I have to go there. It's a terrible thing. But again, we have this open border policy. If you look at the amount of fentanyl that's coming over the border. Now, I, I wrote this down. Custom and Border Patrol seized more than 10,000 pounds in 2021 of, of uh, fentanyl coming from China, fueling overdoses to a record level. In 2021, it, it exceeded 100,000 for the first time ever. And the fentanyl is so strong that they said that roughly one pound 
can kill 250,000 people. So they said the amount that w was recovered, 100,000 pounds in 2021, was enough to kill 2.5 billion people. Think about that. And that's what they recovered. That's what we know they, they confiscated. How about the, the amounts that haven't been confiscated? So we, we're really, really shoveling shit against the tide, as they say. This is, is really, really out of control and disgusting. It is. It's, it's, it's totally disgusting and totally out of control. I want to play a little bit of this. Control agents are evidently the real reason police did nothing during the Uvalde school shooting. It's not us saying it, but it's USA Today. Why they said it is kind of curious. This is the headline. It was on their home page. How aggressive Border Patrol tactics in Texas contributed to inaction during Uvalde shootings. The article says a recent wave of school lockdowns because of border chases caused teachers, staff, and police to be complacent and not take the real threat seriously. This quote caught our eye. Texas police and city leaders say the school lockdowns were necessary because of the dangerous natures of bailouts. There's little evidence that the general public is at risk from the migrants. Really? All right. To be fair, you have all these schools locked down 47 times from February to May, 90% of them caused by border chases. Thankfully, no student was hurt, maybe because of the lockdowns. But that doesn't mean that illegal immigrants coming across the border and the coyotes and human traffickers aren't dangerous. It's almost as if the article says shouldn't chase anybody because somehow people will become complacent about school lockdowns. Consider why that article is written while we look at the numbers of who's coming across our southern border, the people we know about. Since October, agents caught 50 murderers, 809 domestic violence offenders, 248 sexual predators. Those are the people they caught. Remember, there are hundreds of thousands of people who have got away. We don't know who got away in the chases outside the Uvalde schools. Sure, these are new problems for American mayors to deal with. These are the kinds of images that border mayors are used to dealing with every single day chases in their communities. Now in New York City and also in Washington, D.C., the mayors aren't so happy about illegal immigrants showing up. Yolanda Perales Ramon deals with this issue every day, Mayor Pro Tem of Eagle Pass, Texas, with us now. Get you know, Phil, I just before this, this lady speaks, I just want to mention how can they protest something when they're part of the problem? They're behind, they're behind sanctuary cities. They support sanctuary cities because that's supported by their party. So now we're going to listen to them cry about they have no money, but you supported sanctuary cities. You deserve this. It's called hypocrites. They're just hypocrites. It will get to New York and Washington in a minute. Uh, is USA Today right that we should stop having the Border Patrol chase people because schools will lock down? Oh, I hope they don't do that. I hope not because, I mean... Right now, you know, because of what we're dealing with in the border, you know, Border Patrol is just as important as any other um, law enforcement agency. So definitely not. You know, I hope that doesn't happen. So so in other words, Border Patrol continuing to chase people and catch people is something that as a border mayor, you need them to do. Of course. OK, um, this is you've come on before and talked about the problems in your city, because so many mm -hmm. of the people that Border Patrol catches, they then just release into your city and there's the NGOs that deal with them. Uh, Texas, uh, the governor has offered free bus tickets to, for a number of people to go to Washington, D.C. The mayor in Washington now suddenly is not happy about that because illegal immigration is great, except when they take over her homeless shelters. The mayor okay. of New York uh, is quite upset. Border crisis hits NYC. Adams calls on Biden as shelters overrun migrants. If we do not get these urgently needed resources, we may struggle to provide the proper level of support our clients deserve while also facing challenges as we serve both a rapidly growing shelter population and new clients who are seeking asylum. Uh, you've been dealing with these kinds of problems for years. What's your advice to the mayors of New York and DC? Well, my advice to them would be just be patient because it's been happening to us for over a year. So if that just started happening with them, then unfortunately they'll be going through for as long as we have been going through. I don't wish it upon anybody because it's not good, not for the immigrants, not for us, but, um, you know, it's uh, again, I, I just said it a while ago, these are unprecedented times and and tough times call for drastic decisions. And and the state of Texas decided to go ahead and do this. You know, um, unfortunately, 
the mayors of DC and the mayor of New York are, are getting a little bit of what we deal with every day on a daily basis. Again, for the last year, I mean, just last month alone, we had over 13,000 immigrants that went through through here through Eagle Pass. And, and this is just one border city, Eagle Pass. We're a small city, you know, we're a city of 20, 28,000 population at the most. And, and we're having to do that. Can you imagine wow. they're they're in Washington, they're in New York. I mean, come on. <laughs> well, it's, it's funny. It's stunning. 30,000 uh, immigrants coming through your city, 28,000 population. That's double. There's no city exactly. uh, could deal with deal with that. You think about New York, 7 million people. Uh, there in you terms go. Of that. And, and, and they're complaining now. We can imagine what you're going through. Um, they should be able to handle it better than we can. Yeah. They should be prepared for well, that. Well, yeah. It, it, it's, it's, it's stunning. It's Thanks for watching. Go to NewsNationNow.com to find NewsNation on your television. So it's it's incredible that, you know, uh, Lieutenant Pete Pranzo in the chat said, you know, we're coming upon election season. And this is what people that are running for office, they're going to say whatever's going to get them elected. But some of the same people that, you know, they're complaining now, but yet they're all sanctuary city people. They're all believed that New York should be a sanctuary city. Let them stay in New York, no matter what it costs. We'll pay for it. Our taxpayers will pay for it. You know, it's, it's really, it's really pathetic. It's really pathetic. Unfortunately, I think the democratic leadership, they have showed their cards. They want to change the electorate in the United States. They have the uh, assumption that if they bring in enough illegal immigrants and they eventually get the right to vote, that they are going to be able to control elections in the country, that there won't be any, they'll just be a one party country. And I think it's going to backfire on them because a lot of the Hispanics in the country that are here legally don't want the influx of illegals because it's causing in their areas, in their towns, in their cities, it's causing a, a uptick in crime and it's causing all the other different problems. I mean, you can't get medical attention in these areas because if you need emergency care, it's overrun. And if you need a test or you need some follow-up, you're going to wait six months. Uh, we're winding up with uh, severe problems in the healthcare industry and it's just going to go on and on. But they've they've shown their cons. That's what they're that's the reason that they're doing this. They want open borders because they feel if enough illegal immigrants come into the country and they accept them and they can eventually give them the right to vote, that they're going to vote Democrat. That's really what it's all about. According to the Council of the District of Columbia, over 3,000 undocumented migrants have arrived at the U.S. Capitol from Texas since April. The arrivals don't have places to stay, and many are still at Union Station in Washington. Where the this is on the screen. Uh, buses of undocumented uh, illegal aliens are being delivered to Washington, D.C. I love it. Yeah, deliver them to the nation's capital. See how they like it. Or better yet, deliver them to Joe Biden's hometown in Delaware. See how he likes it. You know what I mean? I would like to see Nancy Pelosi uh, deal with some people in Hunter. Well, California, they're already they're already part of the um, the border crisis. So yeah, undoubtedly, I think that some of those people have gone to um, to California, which is already a border a border, uh, which is part of the problem already. How would she feel if a bus pulled up in front of her house and let 50 illegal aliens, uh, left them in front of her house? Now, she's got walls and security and everything, so it's probably not going to be much of, a, of an effect. But how would she feel if that happened to her? You know, it's very easy for them to talk about the policies and we're going to welcome everybody. But, you know, listen, this is a country that was built by immigrants, obviously, but you can't have it overrun. It has to be some type of a... a, a, a a policy in place that you can screen them and you can take them like our ancestors did when, when they came here, that you went through a process, you went through a screening and we don't want anybody that's going to do harm to our country. We don't, we don't want terrorists. We don't want criminals. We want people that are going to make our country better. That's what this country, United States is really all about. However, they just threw all of that out the window. They're looking for power. It's a power struggle. And that's what it comes down to. This is one of 1,200 migrants at this shelter where every spot is taken, many of them by children. Outside, dozens more camp out in the blistering heat. 
Their despair soon turns into intrigue as aid workers begin handing out papers explaining the legal process of border crossings. So Josue is doing an information session right here, very informal. Uh, people walked up and started listening to him. He's holding some sheets of paper. Those sheets have a diagram that explains what would happen if they're detained by American authorities once they reach the U.S.-Mexico border. Organizations like the Coalition for Humane Immigrant Rights now targeting misinformation that often comes by word of mouth or online. Migrants tapping into social media groups to coordinate travel plans and head north. Like this post asking who wants to sign up to create a caravan from Nicaragua to the U.S. Do you think that the large amount of misinformation that is spread among migrants is causing more migrants to go to the U.S. border right now? Yes, I do think that it has definitely an impact in moments. Why is the misinformation pushing more migrants to go to the border? Because they'll use any kind of big date. They'll use it as an excuse to, with, with this May 23rd. And then, you know, last month there was something else. The month before that was something else. There's always going to be some sort of date that they can manipulate and say, oh, there's going to be this change of policy. Implica que van a seguir expulsando las personas. Do you think giving them the right information what's happening at the border will make someone maybe rethink the trip and stay behind? Absolutely. I mean, there we've had many folks that have decided, for example, to stay in Mexico and to, to accept the refugee status here and to try to integrate into Mexico. But for some, they say they have no choice but to continue. Jose Lopez says he feared for his life in Honduras, where gang members shot him and accused him of being a police informant. He and his wife believe that would make their claim for asylum in the U.S. much easier. So he says he read a comment on Facebook saying that the border was open. And there's a lot of messages that are exchanged where people say, come to the border, it's open. Moments later, we reveal to him Title 42 remains in place. His reaction turns to confusion and he changes the topic. Tom, for the migrants that are now in Mexico that have entered the country, the first legal step would be to request refugee status. To do that, they have to come to government offices like these, and that can take time. Now, after they become refugees, they still need a humanitarian visa to stay in Mexico legally and travel within the country. During that time, they can work in Mexico, they can't go to a shelter, uh, but a lot of them end up sleeping on the street because there isn't enough resources in Mexico for all of these migrants in the country. Now, for those of the migrants, for those migrants that have that permit and make their way to the U.S.-Mexico border, then they have to go to the border and under Title 42, request an exemption from U.S. border officials and we know that those exemptions are practically impossible to obtain. So under the current immigration policies, both in Mexico and the U.S., the migrants have very, very few options. So you can imagine the misinformation also that's on social media, and these people are following that. There's not a lot of... I mean, even when you listen to the guy Mayorkas from Homeland Security, you can't get the truth out of that guy. I'm just amazed when you listen to a, a, a bureaucrat from the government, the guy just sits there and lies. He just lies all even. He should be fired immediately. He's an oh. outright liar, Billy. He lied to everyone's face on the Sunday morning shows just the other day, and he's done it numerous other times. He should be fired. He's incompetent. He's a liar, and he should not be in the position he's in. It's disgusting. And one other thing I just want to say, I, I did mention the Democratic Party. Republicans are just as guilty in this because they're not doing anything about it. They should be jumping up and down. They The, the blood of those 53 people that were found dead in the trailer on June 28, 2022 is on the Democrats and the Republicans' hands, both. I don't hold uh, the Republicans in such a high esteem uh, with the whole border crisis. I mean, uh, listen, it's a Democratic uh, president, it's Democratic Congress and, and, and the Senate, but the Republicans could be doing a lot more. They should be calling for the resignation of Mayorkas every minute of every day. He's a disgusting individual that's a liar. And, and, and it's just, it's terrible. 53 people found dead in a trailer abandoned in uh, San Antonio, Texas, which is on the border of Mexico. Uh, 
11 of the people were taken to hospital. There was no food and no water in this truck. Uh, the person that was driving it was eventually arrested. But what good is it? 53 people dead because the message is going out to all these other countries. Yeah, come. The board is open. The, the guy said he read it on Facebook. That, that was just on that interview. So they're going to come and they're going to get here by any means necessary. So they get talked into the back of a tractor trailer with no food or water. They're locked in. Imagine what kind of a horrible death those people went through. And the people that survived were children. They're probably a little bit less vulnerable uh, from the heat exhaustion. So I think there was about 11, uh, 10 or 11 children that did survive, but a horrible, horrible situation. And the blood of those people is on the hands of the American politicians, both Pops, Democrats and Republicans. This is police off the cuff, real crime stories. If you're not subscribed to our YouTube, go on our YouTube. It's free. Hit that subscribe button. Give us a thumbs up. Ring that bell. If you want to support us, we have a Patreon with three different levels. And we also have a YouTube channel memberships with five different levels. And we'd appreciate whatever support you have. We have, uh, we cover some of the most up-to-date cases from a police perspective. As you can see, we get a little, little emotional with some of these cases. But because we, we, you know, we understand this stuff. We've seen it. And it's just like, these politicians, and whether they're Democrats or Republicans, they're liars. They're professional liars. It's it's really disgusting. You know, it's just. And smuggling this empty trailer now tied to the deaths of 53 men, women and potentially children left packed inside among the dead four Hondurans, including two brothers, Alejandro and Fernando Caballero. Dios. Today, their mother mourning their loss, saying her sons were anxious but excited for a future where they could work to build their mom a new home. Mexican authorities cooperating with U.S. investigators are painting a grim picture of the deadly journey. After crossing the border in Laredo, Mexican officials say at 2.45 p.m. Monday, the truck passed through a Border Patrol checkpoint in Encino, Texas. A camera capturing the driver, identified by Mexican authorities as a now-detained U.S. citizen, who then drove through Catula before stopping 146 miles later in San Antonio on a 100-degree day. That alleged driver, named by the U.S. Justice Department as Omero Zamorano, and charged tonight with one count of alien smuggling resulting in death. If convicted, Zamorano faces up to life in prison or a possible death sentence. It's a lot of coordination, so it's suggestive of a higher-level organization. Special Agent Craig Larrabee runs Homeland Security investigations covering the southern Texas border. These organizations, yeah. potentially cartels, yeah. they're really looking at these people as a product. Just a product, a commodity. I mean, that's it's just simple. More people, more money, more profit. On the border, Governor Greg Abbott promising additional checkpoints. Today, alongside the remote road where so many lives were lost, a somber memorial marked by flowers and bottles of water for those no longer here. Morgan Chesky, NBC News, San Antonio. Disgusting. Disgusting. You know, and, you know, it's over, I think the uh, the estimate was over 20-something thousand trucks pass some of these checkpoints. And I guess not every single one of them can be uh, stopped and searched. But this this truck containing these 53 people that died was never stopped, was never checked. It's just unbelievable, Billy. When you have the amount of people that are coming over the border and we have a fake government that says, I mean, the secretary of Homeland Security says that the border is secure. It's just terrible. And the people that are profiting from this are the drug cartels, the smugglers, the human traffickers. I mean, I, I read a statistic. It said every single illegal alien smuggled or trafficked is subjected to some form of mental, emotional, or physical and or sexual abuse. That means every one of them is going to be abused at some way, shape, or form. There was a, a, a story I saw the other day in the news where when they rape these women in, in the path coming over, uh, they're, they're in the, the, the desert in the middle of the night, they leave their bras hanging as a sign for Customs and Border Patrol, like to throw it in their face that they rape these women. It's disgusting what's going on 
Women and children are being abused in this, and they take children over the border because they know that families, and they pretend to be families, families will get different different treatment than just a, a single male or a single female by themselves. So they take children, they're using them as pawns, they're using them as props, and they're physically and sexually abusing them. It's a disgusting situation, and nobody seems to be caring about it in our government. It's just an out of control situation and billions and billions of dollars are being made by the cartels and the smugglers. You know, Homeland Security and Border Patrol, they want to do their job. However, they're being held back from doing their job. They're not being allowed to do their job. Basically what they've reverted them to is just body counters. Count these people, fill out the paperwork, let them go. That's what they've been reverted to. And you can hear the frustration when they interview these Border Patrol people. They're so disgusted because they're not being allowed to do their job. And they're law enforcement guys. And just think of how frustrating that must be for them. It's just out. It's just so, so outrageous. It's ridiculous. These women, uh, you spoke to dozens of women in your report. Describe to us what they told you about their journey once they arrived in the U.S., because I think what is different about Manny's story is he's not just talking about being victims of traffickers in Mexico. Right. He's talking about once they get to the U.S. Yeah. and they think they're going to be safe, they're still vulnerable. Well, yeah, th and thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I mean, that was if there was any, uh, you know, theme uh, to the story. You know, it's this idea that, that, that this is not a, a problem that happens on foreign soil. You know, this is a problem that happens... Uh, on the border uh, in Texas and the other border states. Um, and uh, the women, you know, they, they sort of described this um, this very surreal and otherworldly, you know, experience that they have where they are, they, you know, they are paying a series of, of coyotes who are the smugglers. That's the, the, the shorthand nickname for the, for the smugglers, the coyotes. And they're paying a series of different coyotes <clears throat> to get them across the border. And some of those coyotes hold up their end of the bargain and others uh, use their power to basically manipulate <clears throat> the women and to sort of uh, take advantage of them and exploit them. Uh, and the idea is, I have power over you and I'm going to have my way and, and this will happen uh, suddenly. Uh, it, it could be, you know, planned for, for a day or two. Um, and it's happened out in the outdoors of the brush in South Texas, or it happens inside of a stash house uh, in Arizona. Uh, it, it sort of, it sort of happens uh, in many different ways um, that these uh, mostly smugglers um, decide that they want to take advantage of a woman. You know, the other uh, interesting piece of reporting you have in your story, Manny, is, and I'm going to quote it from here because it's so powerful. When I read this, I was shocked myself. Uh, you write, and such attacks don't end at the border. Women have reported being assaulted in immigration detention facilities, and their federal government over a recent four-year period has received more than 4,500 complaints about the sexual abuse of immigrant children at government-funded detention facilities. Tell me more about that. Yes, I mean, basically, um, it's sort of the same idea where some of the men who are in positions of authority, some of the men who wear badges, um, take advantage of the women as well. When you say you wear uh, badges, and, and you mean ICE agents as well. I do, yeah. We're talking ICE agents, we're talking Border Patrol agents, uh, and we're also talking uh, sheriff's deputies and, and, and police officers uh, occasionally. Uh, it, you know, you know, every when you sort of when you sort of go down the line of of the different men that these women come in contact with, often some of those men uh, take advantage of them and, and, and sexually brutalize them. Uh, and, it, and it doesn't matter sometimes whether these guys have a badge or not. Um, and it doesn't matter if they're in detention or not. It could be out in the brush uh, if an agent comes upon them. Uh, these attacks have happened. It could be uh, inside of a detention facility for ICE, inside a border patrol holding facility. So, in sort of in many different ways, they're just sort of being attacked from 
it's 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 as if they can't even trust um, um, the people in positions of authority once they cross. You know, Manny, not too long ago, the president brought up this idea of women being trafficked as a reason for justifying, you know, a wall on the border and more investment. And a lot of critics of the president sort of said, you know, I don't know where he's getting all this information from. I don't know where he's getting these numbers from about women being trafficked. And he described uh, women being duct taped in the back of uh, vehicles and stuff like that. But your article does describe stuff like that. I mean, was the president on to something despite what the critics had to say? You know, I mean, in a way, yes. You know, in, in, you know, I started working on the story. Uh, actually, it was more than a year. It's been more than a year that I was working on the story. Uh, and so, you know, I, I remember I interviewed um, one of the women and she was talking about being tied up uh, and being tied up when, when she was uh, being raped by uh, uh, some of the men uh, in McAllen, Texas. And and then after that interview, it was months later that this whole uh, sort of thing started where Trump started talking more about this. Um, and so it wasn't it wasn't a shock to me. I think that some of the way he characterized it, you know, it could be seen as an exaggeration. Um, you know, the duct tape and, and women being bound, it does not happen every day. It's, a, it's, it's an extreme version of the rapes that do happen. Um, but it has happened. It's just that it, it doesn't always happen that way. Um, but, but, you know, the, the, but I, I was, you know, shocked myself when I'm reading about some of these different court cases and talking to these women um, that duct tape was used. And the, 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 the women I did talk to who were duct taped, they were duct taped by a border patrol agent uh, in South Texas um, who was on duty and who kidnapped three women uh, and then and then and then raped one of them. Uh, and they described, you know, having duct tape on, on, on their mouths, you know. And so it, it you know, it does happen. But of course, the president uh, doesn't talk about some of these assaults happening from, uh, you know, border patrol agents. Obviously, you know, that that part of it is not in, in, in this rhetoric. And. You know, these allegations of um, rapes against Border Patrol and ICE agents, they obviously need much more care and much more investigation. Uh, and I, I'm not doubting that there is, are incidents where this does and has occurred. Milwaukee civilian said this story needs more care while in custody does not mean abused by ICE. I agree with you, Milwaukee civilian. It needs more uh, investigation, but we're not going to do not deny that it did or could happen because these are law enforcement, uh, these are law enforcement men. Um, Bill, I think you're going to go to a quick uh, Joe Murray commercial. Joe Murray, attorney at law. Have you found yourself in a jam? Are you in need of legal counsel in the New York area? Do you need a victim's advocate? Well, Joe Murray is your man. He's not only an experienced trial attorney, he's also a retired 15-year member of the NYPD. He literally knows both sides of the fence. His website is jmurray-law.com. His telephone number is 646-838-1702. Or you can email Joe at joe at jmurray-law.com. Joe is a great attorney and a friend of Police Off the Cuff Real Crime Stories. And if you'd like to advertise on Police Off the Cuff Real Crime Stories, you can email us at policeoffthecuff, the number one, at gmail.com. The rates are very reasonable. We give you uh, a great, great read. And uh, it might be the right thing for your business. So check it out. Police off the cuff, number one, at gmail.com. You know, this is a, uh, it's amazing how this story of, um, of uh, illegal immigration and people being snuck into the country, the cartels, abusing all these people, how it's not a bigger story, how it's not in the news all the time. And I suppose if you live in Texas or in California and right on the border, it never leaves your consciousness because these folks are crossing the border every single day, every single night. They may even be coming across your own, your land. But we up in the Northeast, now it's just starting to hit us as the illegal migrants come into New York City and New York State and it's causing a, uh, you know, a financial burden to the state and the city coffers. Billy, if you want this story to blow up, where is the Me Too movement? Did you see that statistic? 60% of the women coming over the border are sexually abused. Where is the Me Too? That was an ACLU uh, statistic. 
Where are the women's rights advocates? Where are they? They're the ones that can blow the story up. There's so many different components to this horrible situation that's going on, but that right there sticks out the most to me. Women and children are being sexually abused, coming over the border by these coyotes, these human traffickers, and nobody's jumping up and down about it. You, you, with the Me Too movement, they can cancel culture people for much, much less. How about cancel culturing this illegal activity that's going on in the border. Women and children should be not subjected to this kind of treatment. It's disgusting. AOC went to the border when they said that that, that uh, Donald Trump had people in cages. However, Hawk, Kamala Harris, none of them go to the border now to see the atrocities that are going on in this country. Right now, as we speak, 60% of the women are being sexually assaulted and raped. Disgusting. Outrageous still struggling to get the help they need. We've been telling you how thousands of migrants seeking asylum have been arriving in D.C. for the past few months now. And more buses keep coming, and we're hearing from a group of men who were dropped off at Union Station this week, and they are now sleeping outdoors. Yeah, they tell us a nonprofit group is only helping families, leaving them to figure out things on their own. They don't have a lot of time either. Yeah, Rafael Sanchez Cruz joins us live at Union Station. Rafael, you spent a lot of time talking to these men. What are they telling you? Leslie, well, another bus of asylum seekers arrived this morning here at Union Station. They were taken to a nearby center to re receive assistance, but these men are saying that they are stranded here at this transit station and they're just looking for a helping hand. For four days, at least 20 asylum seekers from Venezuela have been sleeping in and outside of Union Station after being bused in from Texas. Pero a la hora de que se formó todo, lo único que se fueron fueron los... Alfredo says that families with children have been given priority for bus tickets. They have been told by the nonprofit group SAMU that there are not enough funds to provide them with transportation to New York and Miami. They have grown so desperate that they are willing to stay in the D.C. region. Help us with housing. If someone has a home and they can help us, what we want is to work. We have the will to work. We are fighters. We came here for a better future. These concerned D.C. residents felt compelled to bring food and water today. I am a native Washingtonian. I'm a government employee. It breaks my heart. They are human beings. Yeah. Shame on the Biden administration. Shame on D.C. government. Not in our backyard. These asylum seekers are just one of the most recent groups of the more than 3,000 people that have arrived to the... <laughs> it's outrageous. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I echo that woman's words. Shame on the Biden administration. It's Governor Greg Abbott's plan to bus migrants to D.C., protesting the Biden administration's response to immigration. On top of not having a place to sleep, these men are also facing an impending deadline to comply with their asylum cases. We are worried because immigration asks us for a home to call them this Sunday. This Sunday is our deadline. If we do not call them, we do not know what we're going to do. I consulted an immigration lawyer what happens if they do not have this check-in with ICE. She says that this could be used against these asylum seekers in their pending asylum case. Now, I also reached out to Mayor Muriel Bowser's office regarding that letter she received from D.C. council members asking her to use D.C. funds to help the organizations that are assisting these migrants. But we have yet to hear back. Lorenzo? Yeah, we've been contacting the Bowser administration all week and we have not heard. You know, isn't this problem a problem for the government? Shouldn't the government have to solve this problem? How are private individuals? Look, uh, Governor Abbott was one of the governors who delivered all these migrants right to D.C. Because he's tired of the government just allowing them to pour into Texas. You know, and you're hearing some of the Democratic governors and mayors sort of doing the same thing because they're pissed off. And it, there's no solution to this. There's no funds to take care of this problem. So it's really a problem that is just like it's left it's left to, you know, the local government. And it's it's a disgrace. Like I, I said earlier on, a jet landing in Westchester Airport in the middle of the night filled with illegal migrants that they dumped just they just dumped into Westchester. If you were can, if you were so convinced that what you're doing is okay, why would you do it in the middle of the night? 
They were trying to hide under the veil of darkness, obviously, Billy. And why should Texas, a border state, take the brunt of all of these people coming over financially? They have to, listen, we're, we're the United States. If someone needs food, water, shelter, or, or medical attention, we're going to give it to them. So Texas was bearing the brunt of it. So they said, you know what? Enough is enough. Our calls for help about securing the border is falling on deaf ears. So they sent the problem to Washington. I think that that makes a lot of sense. And again, what happened? We got the attention of the politicians in Washington. The mayor of Washington publicly said, oh, it's not right that they're fooling the people to come to Washington. They weren't being fooled. They're being flown to Westchester County on an airplane in the middle of the night. So now they're going to be bused to Washington, D.C. in the middle of the day. Let's show everyone what's going on. I love it. I think it's a great idea. And again, you know, you I know, Phil. I, I just use I just use Westchester as an example because I live there. But many it's other everywhere. many other counties have had the same thing. Florida is getting them too. Is a lot yeah. of places. Yes, Kim Alliston, Thank you so much for the twenty dollars super Kim. sticker. Very much appreciated. Thank you for all your support for police off the cuff real crime stories. This is another example of all the the human trafficking and the human problem and the uh, the abuse of females. Uh, and it's it's happening all over this country. Assault and stop human trafficking gangs. Human trafficking is big business. It generates about one hundred and fifty billion dollars a year globally in illegal profits. Traffickers exploit a number of companies to carry out their deeds, banks to launder money, planes to transport victims, and social media platforms to lure prospects. But there's one major sector where traffickers tend to hide in plain sight, hotels. We know that sex trafficking takes place in hotels and hotel rooms. We also know that individuals working at hotels can be in situations of forced labor. And labor trafficking can take place at any point in a hotel supply chain. Human trafficking is the use of force, fraud, or coercion to obtain some type of labor or commercial sex act. In the U.S., there were more than 10,000 reported cases of human trafficking in 2020, and 72% were related to sex trafficking. Large events like the Super Bowl are thought to bring a spike in sex trafficking due to a high influx of visitors. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated this issue. Criminals are able to abuse new hotel technology like contactless check-in, making it more difficult to spot signs of trafficking. All the while, waves of sex trafficking lawsuits continue to pile up against hotel chains. Now, what we also saw during the pandemic was really a confirmation that trafficking is possible and profitable in the United States because there are systemic inequities and injustices that the pandemic really highlighted. With the impact of COVID-19, civil lawsuits, and increased awareness, what are the major hotel chains doing to curb human trafficking? Hotels and motels are some of the most common venues for sex trafficking. Traffickers generally use the rooms for commercial sex acts, and the ability to pay in cash provides a sense of secrecy through finances. It's estimated that commercial sexual exploitation generates about $99 billion in illegal profits globally. These activities are unbeknownst to hotel management, according to the National Human Trafficking Hotline. But Nakia Vestal, a survivor of sex trafficking, says hotel staff are sometimes in on it. Most traffickers on that scale, they, they always have a set location where they work. They always pick a hotel where they work because they're, it's comfortable for them. They're, they know the, 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 the people at the front desk, you know, they, the people at the front desk know what's going on. So, you know, for them to say, oh, we don't know what's going on. If you, if you see the same individual and these same girls come every day, you know what's going on. In 2000, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, or TVPA, was the first bill enacted to monitor, prevent, and criminalize trafficking. It also penalizes private entities that enable or are complicit with the illegal act. This law was a pivotal moment for survivors. Since then, major hotel brands, as well as smaller motels, have been sued for negligence, profiting from, and even promoting sex trafficking. Experts believe Risa Retrio filed the first ever civil claim against a motel or hotel for its role in human trafficking in 2015. The case was settled and with it, hundreds of other victims have come forward with lawsuits. 
In 2019, 257 defendants were sued for sex trafficking and 117 of the defendants were hotels, more than the four years prior combined. In 2020, 149 defendants were sued for sex trafficking and nearly half were hotels. The hotels accused more frequently were Motel 6, Super 8 Motel, Days Inn, Red Roof Inn, and La Quinta. The low-scale motels, they know what's going on. If you have a hotel where you have porn, where you can go in and there's a porn, like there's a channel, you click a channel, you turn the TV on, porn's on the TV, that's, that's, that's a red flag right there. Although they made up a smaller portion of cases, big-name hotel companies took the top headlines that year. In 2019, six major hotels, including Marriott, Wyndham, and Hilton, were sued by a woman for allegedly turning a blind eye to signs of trafficking in their franchised hotels to continue earning a profit. The defendants contend that they did not knowingly benefit financially from the plaintiff's sex trafficking venture. In the same month, three sex trafficking victims sued three major hotel chains in Houston for gross negligence. You know, this is really interesting, but the, the problem is, is that enforcement of this is, should be the government's problem, not the hotels. Yes, do, do the hotels have a responsibility not to allow, you know, prostitution, human trafficking? Yes, but the only way they'll comply is if there's teeth in the law by law enforcement enforcing this and checking it all the time. Hotels aren't going to give up their profits because they have a huge conscience. I mean, we might like to think that they should or do do that, but it has to have teeth in this thing through law enforcement. 100%, Billy. And I think that, uh, you know, these hotels saying that they don't know what was going on. If you're paying attention and you run a hotel, I have a relative that owns a hotel in Florida. And if you're paying attention and he does, you know what's going on in your hotel. So again, there should be some consequences for hotels that are going to say, oh, we didn't know what was going on. Listen, we don't want anyone, you and I both being from law enforcement, don't want anyone to be subjected to any type of abuse, whether it be physical or sexual, but specifically sexual uh, trafficking and, and all this nonsense. This is disgusting. It's terrible. And listen, there are laws. You've got to just enforce them. And anybody that says that they own a hotel and they didn't know what was going on, especially the smaller ones like that woman pointed out, you know what's going on. Listen, listen. You, you can't take greed over some type of abuse. It, money is not going to be the answer to look any other, go, other way in a situation like that. You really got to have some, uh, you know, you, you got to have some guts and, and face the problem. And I, I don't think that uh, anybody that says they didn't know what was going on, that's not a good defense in my eyes. That's for sure. So, folks, uh, we hope that you enjoyed this show today. We sort of put it together, but it's such an important uh Really important topic, uh, just an incredibly important topic. Uh, and it doesn't seem like it's going away. Uh, this human trafficking problem, this uh, illegal migration problem, unless the government does something about it, it's just our borders, people are just pouring through them. And who's going to suffer for this? Well, the taxpayers won. But also these folks that are coming into a place, look, if they get into this country and uh, they're allowed to enjoy all of the benefits of being a U.S., not even a citizen living here, then they basically got away with the American dream without paying the price for it. You know, Billy, we touched on several different components of this topic, but there's other components of it. Like, for instance, China is responsible for 90% of the fentanyl that com comes into this country. So what they are doing, they're systematically poisoning and killing people within the United States. Don't tell me that there's not a plan in place by China. We got to call them out as well. We got to call out the, the, all the politicians, not only the Republic, uh, the Democrats, we got to call out the Republicans as well. We need to put a stop to this nonsense at the border. Custom and Border Patrol, the agents that want to do the job, they're being overrun by the people. They can't do it effectively. We could have a lot more drugs being confiscated if there were less people coming over the border because of policies like the wall and different drones and all the different security apparatus that they use to stop the people. And once you put out the word, 
publicly that we're going to enforce it and the border is closed, the flow is going to stop because the word's going to go out to all these countries that these people are coming from. And then we can focus on these people, these, these drug dealers, these cartels that are putting this poison into our country to murder our young children. They're basically murdering and, and poisoning our kids. It's just disgusting. And it is a big topic, like you said, Billy, and we only kind of really scratched the surface on it. There needs to be a, an outcry from politicians and all of the people that we called out today. Absolutely. Folks, I just want to thank everyone for uh, coming by and listening today. Uh, tomorrow night, we have a very special show starting at 9 o'clock, and it's called Real Stories from the NYPD. And we have five and maybe even six uh, members of the service telling true stories from their careers in the NYPD. One of the, one of, the, of course, is um, crowd favorite Lieutenant Peter Pranzo, Harlem Raiders, uh, Michael O'Keefe, three-time author, uh, shot to pieces, um, burnt to a crisp, and Requiem in Brooklyn. I think I got all three of them. And then we have Montgomery Delaney. I just got uh, James Cohen, who was the commanding officer of the NYPD Aviation Unit, and he's going to come on too. Uh, these stories should be fantastic, and I'm probably going to get contacted by a lot of uh, – movie producers when they start hearing these stories. But uh, so tomorrow night at 9 p.m., come on in and listen. Guys, thank you so much. God bless. Have a great day. Stay safe, everyone. One episode, just ain't enough.